obviously time. Thanks very much. And uh, you know, this is quite a room. Uh, I understand that Liberace played here, and I, I can't promise anything quite that dramatic. But um, my topic today is a, is a topic that has created some sturm und drang in American politics. Uh, as we all will remember, in 2010, uh, a major law in American social provision was signed into into uh, law by President Barack Obama. Uh, it, uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, does three major things, just to remind us. It sets new rules of the game for private insurance companies in the United States. They can still make a profit, but they have to do it by improving the efficiency of coverage rather than shedding or refusing to cover people who might have health problems. It promises to extend aff affordable insurance, health insurance coverage to ultimately 20 to 30 million more Americans uh, through the expansion of Medicaid to near poor people in various states and the provision of subsidies to help lower middle income people buy private insurance plans. And the third thing it does is to set up exchanges, either state exchanges or federally facilitated state exchanges, in which uh, customers can comparison shop among private insurance plans that meet the regulations and find out if they're eligible for subsidies to afford the premium. So those are the three big things it does. Now the full implementation of this law, particularly the expansions of coverage, have been underway since late 2013. And the first two years of a five-year plan for full uh, expansion of coverage have brought clear policy successes beyond what even supporters of the law thought was possible after, 1912, uh, after 2012. More than 16 million Americans have gained new health coverage under the law. All Americans have gained new protections from insurance company abuses. The national uninsured rate has plummeted from somewhere around 18 to 20 percent before the law went into effect to now under 12 percent, with big gains in health insurance coverage for young adults, African Americans, and Latinos. Employer coverage has not been significantly affected for other Americans who already had it. Price increases have moderated throughout the health care system, and the number of insurance companies co offering competing plans on the state exchanges grew from 25 percent between 2014 and 2015, a clear sign that businesses think they can make a profit through this law. But here's the question. Are the clear policy successes for Obamacare accompanied by political success? Well, if you dropped in for Mars and read the American media, or if you listened to Republicans in Washington, D.C., you would get the impression that the answer is a resounding no, that the law remains wildly unpopular and is on the verge of repeal at any moment. This storyline, uh, especially in the media, has gained renewed potency since March when the Supreme Court heard the latest in an unending round of legal challenges. The King versus Burwell, Burwell case that claims that one phrase in a 900-page law subverts the obvious purpose of the Affordable Care Act as a whole. The plaintiffs argue that uh, that one phrase makes subsidized private insurance plans unavailable, uh, should be unavailable to lower middle income people in many states that did not construct their own exchanges from scratch. But I want to suggest that the constant media refrain and the GOB drumbeat about repeal are very misleading. Uh, an analysis of how this policy is playing out in political context over time uh, supports three claims that I want to briefly make here. First, overall public opinion is actually subtly drifting in the direction of support for the law. 
Second, the real political action is not in Washington, D.C. It's in the 50 states, and particularly in those states that are governed wholly or in part by Republicans. And the final point I'll make is that if the Supreme Court should rule for the King plaintiffs, which I don't believe it will do, but who knows? You know, it's just nine guys and gals, and one or two of them can make the difference. If they should rule for the, uh, the plaintiffs uh, in the King case in June, that will redouble the political problems that Republicans will face, both in the states and in the 2016 electoral cycle. So let me just unpack each of these in turn. First, the big picture for public opinion about the Affordable Care Act is that in a one sense it's unchanged at the level of abstract uh, answers to the question, do you support or oppose Obamacare or affordable care? But in another sense, the core trends are shifting. General public opinion, and here I want to state a premise, general public opinion is not directly relevant to the survival of a major reform that has already been signed into law, upheld as constitutional in 2012 by the Supreme Court, and more to the point, has progressed pretty far along the line of implementation in ways that deliver benefits and profits to large hunks of the American population. So that's my premise. Public opinion matters in the sense that it can embolden certain kinds of challenges or dampen them down. It can be referred to in ongoing partisan and legislative battles, but it's not determinative of the outcome. Even so, what we know about opinion on the Affordable Care Act offers ammunition for both opponents and supporters in the continuing struggles over whether this law is to survive. Overall approval and disapproval have changed really very little in five years. You know, there's ups and downs, but the split is along partisan lines, and it's currently at 43% disapproval and 41% approval. It's important to note that if you ask about affordable care rather than Obamacare, it gets better for the law. And if you um, <clears throat> ask why people oppose the law among those who do, about one quarter of those opposed actually would like to see a bolder and more extensive uh, health reform, not uh, less. Apart from Republican identifiers who in the majority want repeal, this overall deadlock really doesn't offer much ammunition for the supporters of repeal. It keeps Republicans talking about repeal because 60 percent of their core supporters say they want repeal. But uh, a plurality of 46 percent of Americans, mainly made up of Democrats and independents, uh, wants uh, either uh, continued ex uh, implementation of the law as it stands or expansion of the law. Crucially, and this is really the crucial point about opinion, over the last two years of full implementation of the law, two-thirds of Americans have gained awareness of what's actually in the law. In particular, they're now aware that there are exchanges, Medicaid expansions to cover the near poor, and subsidies for people who purchase plans on the exchanges. These provisions have always been very popular, but not until recently did most Americans know they were actually in the law. Clear majorities, moreover, want the subsidies for purchases on the exchange to be restored if the Supreme Court uh, restricts them after June. And that's true of majorities of Republicans, as well as independents and Democrats, in the states that would be affected by any ruling by the Supreme Court against subsidies. All right, that brings me to my second major point, which is the political action is not really at the national level, and it's not really between Democrats and Republicans. It's within the Republican Party. And in fact, I would argue the Republican Party is where all the interesting things are happening in American politics these days. Uh, so it's a great time to be studying Republicans, um, if you're a political scientist. The constant refrain about repeal at the national level has mistakenly given the impression that Republicans are united in that camp. 
And of course, we saw the presidential contenders in 2012 all pledge allegiance to the idea of repeal. Even more so, all of the Republican contenders in 2014, where they were facing a smaller, conservative-leaning electorate. But the repeal rhetoric is just that. It's aimed at firing up the conservative half of GOP-based voters who call themselves sympathizers with the Tea Partiers. As an actual policy, repeal is not realistic. And we can tell that by looking at what's been going on in the states, where a lot has been happening since the Supreme Court ruled in 2012, June of 2012, that states could not only decide if they wanted to set up their own exchange or work with the federal government on one, they could also decide whether to go ahead with accepting federal money to expand Medicaid to the near poor. That decision by the Supreme Court reinforced the centrality of states and state-level politics in the implementation of uh, health reform. Uh, and since that time, <clears throat> on the surface of it, a clear partisan split has developed. In 2011 to 2013, before the law started to go fully if, into effect in 2014, all the states governed by Democrats chose to either set up their own exchange, cooperate with the federal government on running an exchange, and they chose to expand Medicaid with federal funding under the health reform law. Republicans hung back in many ways. But a closer look, particularly as 2014 approached and ever since, shows that there are sharp divisions, persistent divisions, civil wars or at least guerrilla wars over the question of expanding Medicaid in all of the GOP run or states where GOP uh, legislators hold sway. That's because the Tea Party wing and the business-oriented wing of the Republican Party see this matter very differently. Uh, research by my graduate student collaborator Alex Hurdle Fernandez uh, revealed that chambers of commerce endorsed expansion in, in at least 22 states, and many of them Republican-led states. The key variable for the chamber was whether healthcare businesses played a role in its leadership, and in all the states where, they, where it did, they pushed uh, for expansion. And many Republicans, particularly Republican governors, responded to that call. Outside of the Deep South, plus Texas and Oklahoma, many business-oriented Republican governors, including Rick Snyder in Michigan, John Kasich in Ohio, most recently Mike Pence in Indiana, have f figured out a way to get around Tea Party opposition uh, or to sideline Americans for Prosperity, the Koch-supported group that pushes against Medicaid expansion everywhere all the time, and get it done for their states, reaping millions to billions of dollars in Medicaid funding. By now, and the most recent entry into this is the state of Montana, where a Republican governor persuaded conservative Republican legislators to join Democrats in adopting the expansion over fierce opposition from Americans for Prosperity. By now, 29 states plus the District of Columbia have moved forward with the Medicaid expansion, and that includes 20 states where the Republican Party is either fully in charge or has a, a major amount of control in the troika of uh, chambers and, and the governorship. So my final point here is that going forward, the political drama is going to continue to be mainly about Republicans. Um, The implementation of the law proceeds apace. It, for example, we just passed a tax season in which there was supposed to be a national media meltdown over the individual mandate and the tax penalties that many consumers were supposed to um, uh, owe. But the Obama administration urged states to reopen enrollment in the health plan for people who realized on April 14th that they were supposed to have enrolled by in February. And the whole thing passed with very little foo for all. Uh, so the next big moment of drama is in late June when the Supreme Court, probably before leaving town the next day, will decide whether seven to nine million middle income consumers in Republican governed states that have not set up their own exchanges 
will lose their federal subsidies. 85% of those consumers depend on those subsidies to make insurance affordable. If the Supreme Court rules that the subsidies are not acceptable under its reading of the statute, that will create an immediate crisis that will hit white, predominantly white, predominantly lower and middle income voters, at least half of whom support Republicans, and virtually all of whom are living in Republican governed states. Equally important, it will hit dozens of insurance companies that will immediately face a market meltdown in the particular states affected by the subsidy cutoff. That's because the health care law has in rules that tell insurance companies they have to take all comers, but those rules work only if people have the money to buy the plans that the insurance companies are selling. If many suddenly lose the money that makes those plans affordable, only the most desperate, those with very bad health conditions, will continue to pay the suddenly higher prices. And many other citizens in those states will also face higher prices on those states' insurance markets. Meanwhile, democratically governed states will just move happily along with subsidized customers, happy profit-making insurance companies, and Medicaid expansions. So the dilemmas that will be created here will be political dilemmas for Republicans, and particularly Republican governors like John Kasich in Ohio who have endorsed Medicaid expansion for the near poor but will suddenly have to explain to their middle income, in many cases Republican-leaning citizens, and to their insurance companies why they're facing an economic, a sudden and sharp economic loss. As social scientists, we know that when people face sudden losses, political realities and public opinion change in an instant. All Barack Obama has to do is say we can fix this with a simple tweak of the language, send that to Congress, and sit back and watch the Republicans fight over what to do next. And here I'll wrap it up by saying what I think will happen. Part of the purpose of the kind of analysis that scholars like myself and my collaborator Larry Jacobs, who's here today, uh, do, uh, an analysis that looks at the interplay of politics and policy over time rather than at a snapshot in time, is to put yourself in a position to be able to say something intelligent about alternative scenarios going forward. Don't get me wrong. It, historical institutional political scientists are no better than any other kind of political scientist in, in predicting exactly what will happen, but we can suggest what the scenarios will be. If the Supreme Court throws a bombshell into the subsidies and into the Republican Party in the process, um, the first thing that will happen is that President Obama will propose a fix. The Republicans in the House of Representatives in particular will be unable to agree about what to do about President Obama's demand. Uh, they talk about repeal and replace, but they can't agree on a replacement. The most one could expect would be that Speaker Boehner and Majority Leader uh, McConnell would try to use a coalition of Democrats and some Republicans to put through an extension of the subsidies through the 2016 election. It is not clear that Democrats would agree to that. The other thing they will do is demand that the insurance company rules be relaxed, and it's a certainty, although I have not spoken with him, that President Obama would not accept that idea. Why should he got his own law? Going into 2016, such a Supreme Court decision would raise this issue to DEFCON 4. Uh, Democrats would finally find it in their interest to start talking about what's being lost and to start pointing to the benefits that millions have gained and the, the profits that are being made in the uh, healthcare system. Uh, even the most timid Democrats would find their voices in that scenario. And you can be sure that Hillary Rodham Clinton, if she is the Democratic nominee, will stand up for um, a restoration of the full benefits to all Americans under the Affordable Care Act. On the other hand, and I'll close with this, if the Supreme Court, and this is what I think will happen, 
does not accept the argument, the, the, the patently implausible argument being put forward by the King plaintiffs, then I think this issue will gradually lower in tone. It'll still be an issue in 2016 because every Republican presidential contender will have to promise repeal with varying degrees of noises about replacement without having to say exactly with what. But um, the electorate in 2016 is going to have many more millions of voters who come from the groups, minorities, young people who have benefited from this law. And awareness will be greater in a presidential year about the stakes of repealing or significantly gutting uh, the law. If a Democrat wins the presidency in 2016, it's really all over. Even Texas will sign on to the Medicaid expansion with a, within a couple of years of grumbling. If a Republican should win in 2017, after promising repeal with majorities in the House and the Senate backing him up, my prediction is he won't be able to bring about repeal either. By then, the numbers of millions of Americans benefiting from the law and the insurance companies and other health care providers reaping profits under the law will be so numerous, so entrenched, and so quietly determined to protect their advantages that even if something passes Congress and is signed into law that's called repeal, it will really just be a renaming of Obamacare with another term. And that would be the supreme irony because Obamacare was a renaming of Romney Care in the first place. So I'm happy to take people's questions and comments. Okay, so I have to And I hope you'll say oh, who you are and, and make your comment or ask your question. Yeah, I was going to say I have to pretend like I'm Oprah or something and go into the audience so that they can hear your questions. So anybody have any questions? Yeah, you do because they're recording They're forcing it. me. Okay. And they want to hear your question. Okay, um, Adam Newmark, Appalachian State University. Um, in the event that the plaintiffs do win, so, uh, if the plaintiffs win yes. in the Supreme Court, yeah. I'm wondering if there's an alternative, and that is that even those individuals that are most affected by the fact that they no longer have the subsidies will blame Obama for the law in the first place, despite the fact that it appears that what got them in this mess are those who oppose it in their states. And I'm wondering if, despite all of that, they're still going to blame Obama for putting them in this predicament in the first place. You know, I just think that's implausible. First of all, you have to assume that um, the president will not uh, say anything. Um, uh, it'll, uh, the, the most recent Kaiser polls, which is what I was citing on, the, on the, uh, the stated desire of majorities, particularly in the affected states, to restore the subsidies, show that people are generally aware. And in political science, I think we know that parties and political leaders gain reputations for certain things. The reputation of the Republicans as being opposed to subsidized health care is pretty clear at this point. I'm not saying that people will like Obama or like Obamacare. Uh, I'm just saying they'll say, whatever you call it, find a way to make sure I can still afford my family's health insurance plan and find a way for my company to avoid facing a death spiral because we have to accept customers but not make the profits that we're accustomed to. We already know that in many states, the Republicans and moderate Democrats who have moved forward with implementation have used different labels than Obamacare. They refer to the exchange in Kentucky as Kynact, and in many states, people are used to a local label for Medi Medicaid. So uh, those labels will be in play in, in those states. 
and regardless of whether people know it's Obamacare or not, I don't think that they're going to be blaming him uh, for the loss of those subsidies. I, I, it'll be an interesting experiment to see. Uh, I hope we don't see it, but uh, uh, that's my prediction, that they won't. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Richard Sobel. Um, very interesting talk. I'm curious what your thoughts are on the argument that's being used in the uh, Obamacare, which is the anti-commandeering or commandeering argument. It, it gets a little convoluted, but essentially the argument is that the federal government can't force the states to set up these exchanges. The conclusion from that is basically then Therefore, obviously, the federal government had that option, and the subsidies should go to the federal government. But what, what do you think about that as an argument? Well, I guess you're referring to the arguments that were played out on March 5th when the Supreme Court heard the uh, King challenge to uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, there were two lines of argument that revealed themselves that one or more justices might use to rule against the King plaintiffs. One, which I think may be what you're referring to, uh, was uh, the subject of Justice Kennedy's uh, musings at length. He mused a lot during the arguments about how uh, whatever the statute may say in one particular phrase, if they rule that the federal government uh, couldn't establish these exchanges now, that would be imposing a punishment on the states, or it would have presumed that the law required the federal government to impose a punishment on the states if they didn't set up the exchanges, and that in itself would be unconstitutional. Um, the defenders of the Affordable Care Act made everything they could of that line of argument, which in a way builds on the grounds on which the Supreme Court found the law constitutional in 2012 and ruled that the states could decide about the Medicaid expansion, that they couldn't be coerced. Now, a completely different line of argument was hinted at in the phrase that the Chief Justice uttered. Um, the um, Solicitor General was arguing uh, a, a doctrine called Chevron that suggests that if there's ambiguity in a statute that the, the uh, implementing ed, uh, federal agency has the right to interpret it, which would mean that the IRS had the right to interpret any ambiguity here in favor of universal availability of subsidies. And uh, the Chief Justice, who said nothing, wisely, I think, frankly, uh, why should he wander into this mess? And why should he, in the end, take it on his court to, to blow up American health care? He's not going to do that. But he said to the Solicitor General, he said, well, that means another president could come in and change that interpretation. And, you know, we can all have our tea leaf interpretations of what these utterances mean. Uh, we can just guess. That's a completely different line of argument, which basically says the federal government does have the authority to to interpret this one way or another. So why don't you Republicans elect a president and do it yourselves rather than asking my court to do it? That's what I think the Chief Justice was saying. But that is a completely different line of argument than, uh, than uh, Justice Kennedy was using. Uh, I guess it's possible that they could both rule uh, in favor of the federal government and the health care law using diametrically opposite justifications for their votes. Uh, Phil Howe, Adrian College. Uh, first of all, thank you for an excellent, insightful presentation. Um, currently, President Obama's poll numbers are lower than presumably he would like. Uh, one of the things I expect in the next year is his term winds down. He starts giving a lot of what things look like eight years ago, what they look now speeches, and that, that'll turn around. Leaving aside the issue of a Supreme Court ruling, do you think there's anything he can do to actually use Obamacare as a plus uh, for not only his own polling numbers, but also indirectly for Clinton and for the Democrats as a whole? You know, I do think so. Um, let, me, let me speak, first of all, from the perspective of a study, somebody who's studied the historical development of American social policy. And this is an argument that Larry Jacobs and I wrote up for The Hill recently. Uh, if you step back from all of the this's and that's right now, and you look at the timeline of the implementation of this major 
expansion of American social provision and protections uh, through the federal government. It's actually moving forward with very rapidly compared to, say, Social Security after 1935. It took Social Security arguably two decades to become free from the threat of, of uh, being uh, cut off at the pass or uh, um, uh, rolled back. Uh, and certainly it took it that long to become as universally popular as it now is. Even Medicare, uh, and certainly Medicaid, there was state resistance in many cases to these for quite some time. In a highly contentious political atmosphere uh, and in a tough economy, Obamacare has been moving forward pretty steadily and pretty quickly. Um, by 10 years from now, I just don't think this law is going to be very controversial anymore. After all, the core of it is extremely moderate. It does not destroy private health insurance in America. Arguably, it saves it. Uh, and it, it, it deals with a problem that was becoming steadily more acute in the decades before Obamacare was passed. So it will ultimately be seen as one of Barack Obama's and Nancy Pelosi's greatest achievements. And it will stand up there with uh, some of the major um, um, domestic um, policy accomplishments. Will it become popular? You know, that's an interesting question because uh, as uh, Suzanne Mettler and others have pointed out, this law does a lot of what it does with a hidden hand. It channels subsidies into private health insurance purchases on market-like things called exchanges. Uh, even the Medicaid expansion has the name of, oh, I don't know, main care or whatever it is in each state. People don't even necessarily know it is Obamacare, the federal government. So it may simply be a matter of people getting used to it. But here's my point about public opinion. It's very, very misleading to go out there and keep asking people, do you like Obamacare? The answer you're getting to that is whether they like Obama. And about half of Americans don't like Obama right now. Uh, they'll probably feel better about him after he's gone, and then they'll be angry at whoever's next. Uh, but the minute you try to take away Obamacare, its visibility would suddenly go up. And this, the people's willingness to object to a loss under any label, we know that that would shoot up. It would make the kerfluffle about the loss of pre-existing private plans in 2013 look like, you know, a minor scuffle compared to the war that would break out if you try to actually take away all of these benefits after people are enjoying them. So I guess what I predict is it'll be a plus for Obama in history and it'll be uh, increasingly taken as part of the status quo by most Americans uh, within a decade. Uh, Jim Brassfield. Uh, there's a provision, I forget the section number, that, that provides that in uh, 2017 states will have greater flexibility in using the, the uh, funds coming to them. Do you think that that uh, will have any impact uh, either accelerating the, the Medicaid expansion or making significant changes in the, in the Affordable Care Act the way it is now? Well, um, it's, it's important to keep in mind that actually the federal government has been giving all kinds of adjustments to the states on Medicaid expansion already. In fact, one of the reasons, I didn't have time to go into this in detail, but one of the reasons why many Republican governors have been able to move forward, persuade their state legislatures to accept this, is that they have built on variants of the Arkansas plan, which actually uses Medicaid expansion money to get people to make purchases on the exchanges. Another good reason why if the exchanges go away, I mean, this is a problem. It's even a problem for Scott Walker in Wisconsin because he's refused the Medicaid expansion, but he has, he's using the federally facilitated exchange to uh, deliver private insurance, uh, subsidized private insurance coverage to some of his poor people. So um, 
one of the strategies that the Obama administration has used in this uh, drama is, has been to reach down and make any kind of deal they can possibly make with Republican governors uh, to, uh, to do a variant of the Medicaid expansion that, it, that doesn't cross certain lines, but they've been very, very flexible. Mike Pence in Indiana is the latest one. That's being contemplated in Utah and in Wyoming and in Tennessee as well. So that flexibility is already there. Now, in 2017, states will have the right to propose entirely different systems uh, for their exchange uh, and, and Medicaid, for that matter. Uh, for a while, Vermont was contemplating a single-payer system uh, and, and applying for a, a waiver under the 2017 uh, rule. I think we will see states experimenting with things, and we may see compacts of states in different regions. And the irony here is enormous, because when this law passed, its liberal supporters believed that the law had to live or die through national implementation. National implementation was, is the liberal lodestar ever since um, you know, the New Deal and the Great Society period. But ironically, the fact that the law had to squeak through the Senate after Scott Brown was elected in Massachusetts in a way that left in place a lot of state prerogatives, and then the Supreme Court reinforced those in 2012, that's the saving grace for this law because uh, it's possible for variants of it to be implemented uh, in, in this highly contentious national political environment, and that simply weaves it into the ways of doing business in um, more and more states and makes it, makes it hard uh, for national Republicans to roll back the money flowing through this law without going to war with their own governors and many of their own state legislatures. So. I do think that there will be more experimentation and variation, and I think that's a good thing. We don't know for sure which variants will prove to be most effective at controlling costs and extending coverage at the same time. Hello. Uh, excuse me. Uh, this is uh, Michael Lukowitz, and um, I want to go a little bit in the, in the not-too-distant past. Uh, 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 to talk about the last, well, not the last one, but the one before in 2012, the Supreme Court ruling, because when I was watching that at the time, I thought the uh, plan would be dead once I heard Roberts was writing the decision, and the fact that Roberts wrote the decision that saved the individual mandate by labeling a tax, not a penalty. And I, would, I wanted to get your perspective on why, why you think Roberts went that route. Was it a political reason? Was it because he honestly saw it that way? Well, this is one of these questions that I can answer without any danger of any empirical evidence ever. Uh, it's perfect. I'd like to thank you for asking this question. Uh, my hypothesis, which those of you who are young might be able to test someday long after I've gone to my reward, is that Elena Kagan persuaded the... the um, Elena Kagan is, is a conservative whisperer. That's what she is. She was that as the dean of the Harvard Law School. She's very, very good at working out a way uh, to make a deal with conservatives. And I think she persuaded uh, Roberts uh, not to um, destroy the law in what would have been actually a very high stakes maneuver for his court, just as, as a decision to destroy much of the law this June would also be very high stakes for his court. But she, she joined him, in ex, or at least accepted the trade-off of the Medicaid, the optional Medicaid expansion. That's my theory of what happened here. But let's think about Chief Justice Roberts. Chief Justice Roberts is a very, very conservative man who has a uh, clear agenda to gut voting rights, probably to roll back much of business regulation in this country to as far back as the New Deal. Um, that agenda is put in danger if he identifies the court with a blatantly political move in response to implausible arguments. Furthermore, if he was willing to take the heat in 2012, why would he now uh, want to go down that road? It's very clear why Republicans in Congress, Mitch McConnell said it right out, please do this for us. 
we can't do it ourselves. But it's not clear why the Chief Justice, who has to think about the institutional interests of his court and the overall agenda that he and his uh, conservatives want to pursue in the court, why he would take this particular step uh, this June. So I don't think he's going to. Um, but, you know, I, I guess we'll find out if I'm right about that. But we are not going to find out if I was right about the deal between the Chief Justice and Elena Kagan. getting my exercise after lunch here. Greg Sanders, CSS. So I think you've done a good job ex explaining the popularity of the law as compared to historical ones. I mean, five years ago, given the policy successes, I would have predicted better electoral uh, performance by the Democratic better Party. Better what? Electoral. Um, well. What was my mistake? Is it that social policy is not that influential for electoral politics? Was something different this time? Did I just not know my history and it went similarly? Thank well, you. Well, you know, here's where I have to introduce a factor I haven't talked about at all. And I'm surprised somebody hasn't challenged me on this. What about the odd silence of the Democratic Party? You know, <laughs> this law passed with only Democrats. It passed with... Um, adroit and absolutely determined leadership from uh, both Nancy Pelosi, frankly, and Harry Reid, uh, as well as Barack Obama's uh, being pulled back into the cause after the Scott Brown um, debacle took away the, the tentative supermajority that they had in the Senate. Many Democrats who voted for this law knew that they were going to pay the price of losing the next election, in part because of it. A fair number of them looked themselves in the mirror and said, OK, I'm going to do it anyway. So after all of that, particularly once the benefits start to flow to millions after 2013, why aren't they talking about it? Why uh, is all of the talk on the other side? Uh, and we know that that matters. We know that what leaders say or don't say influences public understanding and public opinion. And most Americans, the, the, the polling shows, state by state polling and the media research shows that most Americans have been exposed to repeated, largely factually false attacks on the law, but have rarely heard anything about what's in the law or why those things are good for most Americans. I, I mean, I'll give an anecdote. I mean, I go to a working class diner for breakfast every morning at 6 a.m. So this is in Massachusetts, right? Liberal Massachusetts. And partway through all of this battle, I mean, we mostly talk sports. You know, we're talking about the Patriots. I'm an expert on that. Uh, but, but somebody asked uh, in the little group of people that are there at 6, to, what's this Affordable Care Act? Does, what does it do? So I did my little three things. You know, the new rules of the game, the subsidies to help people afford insurance, and the comparison shopping. The waitress looked up and said, well, why hasn't anybody told us that? <laughs> it's in Massachusetts. Uh, you know, the, the polling is that most people are, are only gradually learning that these things that are wildly popular when the Kaiser people ask about them in the abstract are actually in the law. They all know the individual mandates in the law, even though the individual mandate affects about 4% of Americans. So, um, and death panels. Many people, older people, think death panels are in the law. I had an older woman explain that to me in detail in Virginia when I did my research on the Tea Party about the death panels. Um, so, uh, there is a mystery here, and my only answer to it is two things. First of all, the Democrats were exhausted by the 15-month process of haggling through this law. By the end of it, most of them knew a great deal, not just about the forest, but about the trees, the tree limbs, the leaves, and the points on the leaves. 
They have also heard from people on the left who say the law is a sellout to the insurance companies over and over and over and over and over again, even though it is the most redistributive, equality-enhancing law to pass in the last 50 years in the United States. Um, so they kind of forgot how to explain it uh, by the time it was done, and they were also exhausted. Furthermore, the Democrats listened to pollsters, and that's a big mistake. Because what pollsters say is, don't talk about it if it's not popular. That's what Democratic pollsters say. That's not what Republican pollsters say. Uh, but I think many of them have listened to that. And so you had the odd drama in Kentucky in 2014 of a Democrat who probably wasn't going to win anyway. You know, Allison Lunder Green Grimes wasn't, probably wasn't going to win. But she's in a state where 400,000 people have affordable health coverage for the first time, uh, where the coverage itself and the, is popular, and where she was running against a, 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 a leader in the U.S. Senate who promised to get rid of all that. She never really called him out on that during the entire election cycle. That is nuts from any sensible political perspective. But that's been part of the answer here. The opponents who understand the political stakes of this law, which were outlined by Bill Kristol in 1994, have been loud and unremitting in their, their outcries against it. And the supporters have gone silent uh, for many. That game will be over, however, if the Supreme Court rules for the King plaintiffs this June suddenly the whole thing will become very visible and very dramatic going into the 2016 elections. And I think that would slightly advantage Democrats in a high turnout year because they'd finally have to talk about it, whether they wanted to or not. Okay, I think we should stop there. Okay, thank you so much.